This is Euronews Tonight. Here are your top stories. The Uber files. A data leak reveals how the ride-hailing app allegedly lobbied leaders, including French President Emmanuel Macron, to grab new markets. Fears over Germany's energy supply. Russia says it is shutting down its largest natural gas pipeline to Germany for maintenance, but Berlin's concern the cutoff could be permanent. Ukraine vows to amass a one million strong army equipped with Western weapons ready to try and recover its southern territories from Russia. And in the UK, 11 hopefuls put their hats into the ring to become the next prime minister, as Boris Johnson says he isn't backing any candidate to replace him. I'm Helena Humphrey. Welcome to the programme. Ride-hailing app Uber has been accused of lobbying top Kremlin officials in an effort to secure its grip on the Russian market. That is according to findings of an investigation by leading international news outlets citing evidence from over 120,000 leaked documents. The so-called Uber files reveal how the Silicon Valley company sought to encourage investment by hiring a political lobbyist with links to Russian oligarchs. Experts say that the move should have rung alarm bells and also risk breaching U.S. anti-bribery laws. Well, we can bring in Dean Starkman now, senior editor at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Good evening to you. Thanks for being with us. Um, your group of journalists score, uh, scoured Uber texts, emails, invoices, all sorts of documents, essentially. Uh, what were the main takeaways of what you managed to uncover? The the principal takeaway for me was the ease uh, with which Uber was able to gain access to some of the most powerful democratically elected leaders on the face of the earth uh, with uh, using high-powered lobbyists from A-list -A people from the Obama administration and elsewhere. They had uh, the ear of, of people that and they, it shows clear, the clear advantages that, that uh, wealth, essentially, will, capital will, will have on on the democratic process. And this was all while they were flagrantly either violating or ignoring uh, local transportation and labor laws in a, in a bid to, to basically crash into these markets. Now, I think it's fair to say that for as long as Uber essentially has been around, there have been headlines and reports about the country. Um, but it's interesting that your investigation also, also uncovered alleged stealth technology, stopping more essentially coming to light. Tell us more about that. Right. We, we, this, we didn't discover their use of tech, stealth technology, but we did discover that it was used far more extensively than had been previously reported. And there are... Uh, particular technologies that uh, that I had I certainly hadn't heard about, including the kill switch, which is essentially uh, a, a, div a a protocol that would allow uh, uh, people in the in local offices like Amsterdam and Paris, and for, for instance, to literally cut access to Uber data in the midst of, of police and, and authorities authorities raids on their on their offices, essentially essentially uh, evading uh, their obligations to, to, to cooperate with, uh, with, with le legitimate law enforcement investigations. Now, you talk about access to political heavyweights. Who were some of those figures and what were these lobbyists able to get them in some cases to do? What was, again, striking for me was the, the preponderance of centrist and left, left centrist uh, Political figures from the Obama administration, David Plouffe and Jim Messina, are really well-known names over here, who uh, were were deployed to to gain access to some of the most you know important people you know in in Europe, including Emmanuel Macron, with whom uh, Uber developed a particularly intimate relationship. Uh, we show that in one instance, at least, Macron was able to uh, or, or offered to. To intervene in a in a regulatory matter in Marseille, and uh, it's clear that it's clear that that uh, that Uber had the ear and the sympathy of, uh, of 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 some of the most important people in Europe. All right, Dean Starkman, senior editor at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Really great to have your insights. Uh, the results of this investigative effort. Thanks a lot.
Well, the investigation has sent shockwaves across Europe, notably in France, as you just heard there, where President Emmanuel Macron is facing considerable criticism for his alleged involvement in Uber's lobbying campaign in the country. French newspaper Le Monde accuses the then economy minister of securing a, quote, secret deal with the transport firm. Opposition figures are now calling for a parliamentary inquiry into the document. So let's bring in our international correspondent in Paris now, Annelise Bourges. Uh, Annelise, uh, to what extent is the French president implicated in this and how big of a problem could it be for him? Well, Emmanuel Macron is not being accused of anything illegal, at least technically speaking, but of questionable practices. And his team have been playing the whole thing down, saying the fact that he uh, met with Uber executives or exchanged with them in view of uh, seeing what kind of help the French government could put forward uh, is by no means part of a secret deal with the company, only part of his job as economy minister. They have also been uh, noting that the fact that these documents uh, don't include anything that suggests Emmanuel Macron could have benefited personally from this relationship. Or rather, uh, they say that France has benefited as a country from the establishment, from the creation of Uber in France in terms of the creation of jobs, but also the creation of more options for uh, consumers. Um, in terms of just how big of a problem this can be for the French president, we are now uh, seeing a vote of no confidence here in the French parliament. A debate has been going on for the last few hours. And to be honest, uh, the so-called Uber gate, which is how uh, this investigation is being labeled here in France, has been virtually absent from the discussion, apart from a few mentions from a few uh, MPs. The truth, Helena, is that there's, there's no secret uh, then economy minister Emmanuel Macron wanted to relax labor laws, that he supported the digital economy, the transformation of the French economy and the, these tech startups. Um, this, however, has been feeding the debate here in France. As you said, MPs suggesting they want an investigation. And in the corridors of the French parliament today, many of the MPs telling me that Emmanuel Macron placed uh, U.S. interests above uh, France's interests, that he placed U.S. companies above French workers. Uh, but at least for now, this doesn't seem to be the biggest problem Emmanuel Macron has uh, to solve. Securing uh, support for some of his ambitious reforms going forward seems to be the most pressing challenge for the French president right now. Annelise Borges is there in Paris on the political ramifications there of the so-called Ubergate. Annelise, thank you. Well, the Nord Stream 1 pipeline shuts down for maintenance today. And although it is an annual inspection, politicians in Europe fear that Russia could decide not to turn the gas back on. Mary Bowden can tell us more now. Gas has stopped flowing through the biggest pipeline linking Russia to Germany today. It's a scheduled shutdown, but politicians fear this year President Putin could use it as a pretext to inflict economic and political pain on Europe. It carries 55 billion cubic meters of gas, a vital source of energy. Nord Stream 1 is always serviced in the summer, with the pipeline being shut down, usually for 10 days. But given the pattern we've seen, it wouldn't be super surprising if some little technical detail is found, and then they say, we can't switch it on again now, we have found something during maintenance, and that's it. So in this respect, the situation is clearly tight. A prolonged squeeze in supply would also prevent European countries stockpiling the gas before the winter. But the tactic would also leave Russia without revenues used to fund its war in Ukraine. Mario Bowden, Euronews. Well, in Germany, covering this story for us tonight is reporter Kate Brady. Good evening to you, Kate. Good to see you. I mean, the word from Russia is, is that this is routine maintenance, but I wonder there in Berlin, are they preparing for the possibility that these taps might just not ever come back on? They certainly are preparing for that possibility. And the harsh reality right now is that Germany simply isn't quite there when it comes to being prepared for the outcome should uh, that gas supply through Nord Stream 1 not be turned back on again. And the head of Germany's uh, energy regulator has previously, in recent weeks, repeatedly warned that Germany currently has about two to three months' worth of stores, which would get us to here in Germany to barely to the beginning of the of the autumn here. So, of course, that 
that is really a real concern. We heard from Robert Habeck there, the German vice chancellor and also the energy and economy minister here in Germany as well, who has previously said that even the current reductions in the, the gas until today uh, through Nord Stream 1, he saw them as being more political and saying that the, uh, the repairs that had been cited by Gazprom didn't usually need uh, the level of reduction in gas that, that Germany had been experiencing. So that really is a concern right now. And as we've seen since the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Germany is still scrambling to try and find more energy resources. But of course, none of the uh, measures really have any immediate effect right now. There are some measures in place like expanding uh, onshore wind farming, for example, and also just recently, we spoke about Germany uh, reigniting uh, some coal-fueled uh, electricity plants, but that's not going to change anything overnight. So another important point that Robert Harbeck, the economy minister, underlined today was certainly the need for European solidarity, which effectively means borrowing uh, among European friends, shall we say. Exactly. That's what that phrase means. Um, it's a difficult position to be in, to have to go around asking other European countries who could essentially also be hit too later, one would think. So uh, how will this all work out? Well, it certainly is a difficult point. It is worth uh, reminding ourselves as well that certainly a lot of European, of your, Germany's European neighbours and friends had been warning Germany for many, many years about how reliant it had become on Russia for its gas. Uh, most recently, until the invasion of Ukraine, Germany was importing 56% of its natural gas from Germany. So certainly a, a, a limited amount of schadenfreude among European friends right now. But of course, um, among the EU 20 they are trying to take a united front going forward towards uh, the winter months for which Germany and Europe is already preparing for. And effectively, what does that mean? Well, we might even see rationing, and that's certainly a word that we might see some more of in the next in the next months, particularly as we head into winter. There are some other measures that could be. Um, brought into fruition. For example, the US has already said that it could send over 15 billion cubic metres of liquefied natural gas. But even then, there are problems. Europe doesn't quite have the capacity to store all of that either. So certainly Germany, like the rest of Europe, right now preparing for an expensive and cold autumn and winter ahead. And potentially having to have some rather difficult conversations right now with European allies. Kate Brady there in Berlin. Kate, thanks a lot for that. Well, rescue workers in Ukraine are continuing the search for survivors after Saturday's airstrikes on three apartment buildings in the eastern city of Chesivyar over the weekend. 24 people are confirmed dead. Dozens more have been injured in the latest Russian assault on the Donbass region. Now, Ukraine's defence minister says that Kyiv is planning to amass a million-strong army to push back against the invasion. In an interview with the UK's Times newspaper, Alexei Reznikov said that the army would focus on recapturing the south and its access to the Black Sea. But some analysts have questioned whether an army that size is a realistic goal for Kyiv in the immediate future. Who will be the UK's next Prime Minister? The race for the Conservative Party leadership is now underway after Boris Johnson was forced to step down last week under pressure from his cabinet. When the new party chief is elected, he or she will also take over from Johnson as Prime Minister. Well, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is the latest hopeful to throw her name into the ring. Her announcement means that there are now 11 candidates fighting it out for the top job, including former Chancellor Rishi Sunak and former Health Secretary Sajid Javid. Both men resigned from the cabinet on Wednesday within minutes of one another, leading to Johnson's downfall. Well, across all of the runners and riders for us is our reporter Vincent McAvinney in London. Uh, Vinny, we've got the field now taking shape. Who is running and what are they promising? Yeah, as you mentioned there, we've got 11 candidates. They have until this time tomorrow, effectively, to declare. There are some rumours that some others might join, the likes of Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, the likes of even... Jacob Rees-Mogg apparently mulling over whether to run and represent the sort of farthest right of the party. Now, the candidates have all been trying to get out there and make waves. It is a very crowded field. They've been releasing very slickly produced videos, doing big TV interviews, doing press conferences today, getting as much as uh, a copy as they can in the papers. And it does seem that the big message that's coming through is on taxes. You're basically getting three camps. 
those who are sort of the the, the hat like Rishi Sunak who are sort of saying we have to be as fiscally responsible as possible we shouldn't be promising taxes that's all myth and we need to think about our children's futures those in the center who are sort of saying like Jeremy Hunt look uh, we need to cut corporation taxes to help bring down cost of living and then those like Liz Trust, who's come out today uh, saying effectively from day one, she would be cutting out personal taxes as well as corporation taxes. And they want to pull the UK into a sort of low tax, low regulation, uh, what's dubbed the sort of Singapore on sea model. So at the moment, they're struggling to break through. But we think uh, that with the levels of support some of them are getting, there will be some dropouts in the next few days who simply can't go on uh, and it'll be a much tighter pack. Uh, but at the moment, tax for, does seem to be the really dominant issue in all of this with the cost of living crisis. All right. Well, we've also got the 1922 committee meeting to today to discuss the timeline for the leadership race. What can we expect? Well, I think the timeline, which we should get later on today, will effectively be, as I said, the close of nominations is tomorrow. Then there'll be a first round later in the week. If anyone cannot get past a certain threshold, we think that's going to be about 20 fellow members of parliament who back them, then they will fall. There will then be a second round next week in which there will probably be only two contenders after that. Now, we know there will be a TV debate uh, on one of the British channels on Sunday night, another one on Monday. Uh, by the end of next week, it looks like we will have probably just two candidates running. I think they'll want to keep it short as possible, be done by the end of August so a new prime minister can start September build a new government around them, get ready for the party conference at the end of September uh, and relaunch the party and launch their leadership ahead of uh, what will be just about 20 months or so before they'll have to go to the nation in the next general election. All right, Vincent McAvinney bringing us the very latest from London. Vinny, thanks a lot. Novak Djokovic has claimed his seventh Wimbledon singles title, defeating Australia's Nick Kyrgios in Sunday's final. The victory earned the Serbian tennis star's 21st Grand Slam trophy, just one shy of the record held by Spain's Rafael Nadal. Well, on Saturday, Russian-born player Elena Rybiakina won the women's title, beating Anz Jabeur of Tunisia. Well, for more now, I'm joined uh, live from Dublin by sports presenter Will Dalton. Uh, Will, two weeks of stunning tennis coming to a, a final, coming to an end at the weekend. Bring us up to date with what we saw there on Centre Court. Well, let's go back to Saturday on that thrilling final in the women's uh singles. It was an incredible match between Ons Jabor and Alina Rybakina, the 23-year-old from Kazakhstan, the first Kazakhstani to win a major title and she really showed her mettle in that match. She wasn't expected to win, but she fought back from a set down to take the second and third sets, 6-2, six 6-2. Two, six two. She said after the match she didn't know how to celebrate. She was even that surprised. But something tells me the way she dominated Wimbledon this year at times, it won't be the last Grand Slam we, final we will see her in. In the men's, Novak Djokovic, Nick Kyrgios, a little bit more predictable, people might have said, but you never know what you're going to get with Nick Kyrgios. And of course, that man... Uh, has always beaten Novak Djokovic. They've only met twice, but Djokovic had never tasted victory against the Australian. And, of course, he lost the first set. People began to talk, well, maybe an upset is on the cards. However, Nick Kyrgios, as I said, he's a bit of a maverick, seemed to be arguing with everybody, including himself, talking to the people in his own box. And he lost the next uh, three sets to let Djokovic take his seventh Wimbledon crown and his fourth in uh, succession, an incredible performance by him. He's now one behind Rafa Nadal in the all-time list uh, on 21 Grand Slams. But, of course, we may not see him at another Grand Slam until next year because, of course, he's not vaccinated, which at the current time means he won't be able to partake in the US Open or next year's Australian Open. Well, for anyone who's feeling sad after the end of Wimbledon, there's, of course, always the Women's Euro 2020 continuing this evening. We've got hosts England taking on Norway in Brighton. What can we expect from that matchup tonight? Well, we can expect the battle of the top two teams pretty much in this group. Uh, Norway sit on top because of goal difference. You could say, arguably, they had the easier opening game against Northern Ireland. Uh, England arguably got the hardest game of, of their campaign, obviously, so far against Austria. You would expect the winner of this game to take the group. Uh, for Norway, they'll look to their two talismanic players, um, Ada Hedeberg, of course, the inaugural Ballon d'Or winner and six-time Champions League winner who plays for Leon Shield partner, Caroline uh, Graham uh, Hansen up front. The two of them, if England can keep them quiet, that will be key to them getting a win. Uh, their strike, Alan White, says that, of course, 
they are expecting a big performance from themselves. They are under a little bit of pressure as the hosts of the tournament. But I think if they get the win over Norway, they'll fill that top this group and qualify for the next round. All right, I'm making no comment on that match tonight. Um, our reporter there, Will Dalton, thanks a lot. If you could live anywhere in Europe, where would you go? Would it be Paris, London or Berlin? Well, what about Vienna? According to The Economist magazine, the Austrian capital is the world's most livable city. Our reporter, Tom Hill, has more. Vienna's history and architecture may be the main draw for tourists, but it's the way the city looks after its inhabitants that has most impressed The Economist magazine, declaring it the world's most livable city, not the only accolade the Austrian capital has won. There is also the Mercer study, where Vienna is in first place for the tenth time in a row. It was suspended due to the pandemic. We are now in first place again in the Economist ranking. There's a Green City Index. There's a Smart City ranking, where Vienna is also at the top. The Economist looked at a wide range of city facilities and was impressed by the city's health care services, its education and also infrastructure, including public transport. A million residents, half the population, buys an annual transport ticket that allows them to travel anywhere in the city area for the equivalent of a euro a day. Vienna is a metropolis where I can ride my racing bike here near the vineyards in the afternoon or relax in the Vienna woods and on the same day go to the state opera in the evening and experience world-class culture. For the most part, the Viennese seem satisfied with their lives in this big city, even if climate change is becoming increasingly noticeable. It does get very, very hot in the summer. I mean, that's mostly because of climate change anyway. But Vienna is trying to tackle that with a wide range of pools, public pools, green spaces. I also visit other cities quite often, simply as a holiday. I know that I compare it with Vienna and I think to myself, OK, but in Vienna there are still things I like. So I think it really is the most livable city, or have been so far, simply because of the opportunities it offers. Vienna, where the living is easy. Tom Hill, Euronews. You're up to date. Thanks for your company. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.